Hello, and welcome back to another Blu-ray review, and it's a big one. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for months. I'm a big fan of movies set on trains. That's one thing you should know about me, that subgenre, the train movie. Movies set on trains, movies about trains, movies that have significant sequences featuring trains in them. I'm thinking Back to the Future Part 3 even counts to me as a train movie. I'm all in. I've loved trains since I was a young boy. I love Tom's tank engine. I love like actual trains. I used to cut these little pin badge things. Love trains. And when this was announced, it was like two of my loves coming together, Japanese cinema and the train movie. And the film itself is from 1975, directed by Junya Sato, The Bullet Train. So this just came out from Eureka and I was just dying to get into this film. And uh, yeah, it is kind of uh, not marketed, but kind of, uh, what's the word, promoted, um, sold to people, I guess, in, in modern day as the film that inspired speed, because this is a film about a bullet train in Japan that's been rigged with an explosive device. And if the train goes below 80 kilometers an hour, it will blow up. And of course, that is kind of the premise of the film Speed from the, the mid-90s with Keanu Reeves, directed by uh, Jan de Bont. And uh, there's been some various kind of um, rebuttals on, like, you know, if they took the premise of the bullet train and applied it to the film Speed or, you know, whether it was a, an independent kind of arrival to that kind of plot device. In fact, the... Uh, one of the writers, I think I'm not sure he's, the, he's the sole writer of Speed, but uh, Graham Yost, uh, or Yost, he said that he, he got the inspiration from Runaway Train, which is not really a film about that, but it is a film set on a speeding train that can't stop. Um, and then I, I kind of can see a few little similarities there between Runaway Train and The Bullet Train. That's whole other story. But, um, you know, with... Um, Speed and the bullet train. It even goes further back. And one thing I've I've found in digging through all the extras on this incredible release, I have to, I really am ex almost as, as excited to talk about the release as well as the film itself. But uh, one of the things I found, you know, is that uh, I forget the, the the Doomsday Flight. I think is a film that's brought up in one of the featurettes on the Blu-ray, uh, which is an earlier film, which is about a plane. Uh, that is also rigged with an explosive device, and if if it descends, then it will blow up. So you know, and, and then you know, Junior Sato talks about how he was thinking about the fact that these high tech bullet trains that had been introduced to Japan in the previous decade, the sixties, they had a process where if there was something like you know, you know, there's been a bomb call, a bomb threat, or something, they would um, stop the train at the next stop just to be completely safe and you know they had like a a system to stop it even though it's moving so fast it has that fail safe system locked in and he thought well, what if it couldn't stop you know so he he kind of you know Jun junior sato kind of makes that like he came up with this idea himself there was the previous idea in this this film the doomsday flight it just goes on and on basically you can kind of see who, who took what idea from what but you know this is certainly um, an idea I've never really seen in a film other than Speed. And they're two very different films, um, but invariably it comes up. Um, invariably in the extras and even in the booklet, the recent film um, Bullet Train with Brad Pitt comes up. Apparently there's no real relation between the two, but you know it's, it's just one of those things. The comparisons that get made when you're talking about an old film in 2023, I guess, and you kind of make these modern comparisons. But let's get into the film itself, um, which is translated from Japanese. Shinkansen, big explosion. Uh, Shinkansen is bullet train. It doesn't translate to bullet train, and Shinkansen, I believe, is like the line that it runs on. Um, but bullet train kind of became the nickname of this uh, this train because of the way that the front of it looks, for obvious reasons. And uh, <laughs> one of my favorite kind of um, tidbits from behind the scenes in this is that they tried to work with the Japanese railroad company, but uh, they were not going to cooperate uh, with Toei, the studio that, that made the bullet train, because uh, of the title of the movie, which is Shinkansen Big Explosion. They wanted them to call the film Shinkansen Close Call, you know, and Toei refused. And so the Japanese railroad company was like, right, you're not using our trains, you're not using our stations. We're not going to allow you to use billboards at, on platforms or anything like that. They're very much against it. 
And this little plot is almost like this could be its own movie in a way. It, there was a little plot kind of um, that was concocted. I don't know if it's like an apocryphal tale or whether they're twisting the truth somewhere, but apparently <laughs> they hired an actor, a European actor, to pretend to be from Germany's railroad company. And he actually went in to the control room. Uh, I don't know whether it's in Tokyo or wherever, wherever this was and took secret pictures so that they could make their own kind of version of it for the film because they weren't allowed to film there because the, you know, the railroad company was like, we can, we're not allowing you to, we're not cooperating with you in this at all, which is why I watched this film with Connie actually. And there's a shot um, I'll show you now on screen of the bullet train there at the front on the platform as it is rolling away out of the station. This was like a, a stolen shot. They didn't have the permission to to film that. But as the train's rolling out, um, Connie was like sat next to me going, like, oh, really? They're looking into the camera. You know, they couldn't just. And, I, you know, that stuff doesn't usually bother me as much. But um, that's the reason, because <laughs> as these, these legitimate passengers are on this train taking taking off from the platform, they just see a camera there, and they obviously naturally look towards it because they don't know a movie's being shot. It was a guerrilla-style operation to snatch these shots. And many shots in the film of the train itself, you know, rolling past the camera and stuff, those were kind of, you know, illicit shots that they kind of, you know, grabbed here and there. Otherwise, they created a model um, and there was kind of certain little miniature sets and things like that. And even they had a cameraman, not stow away. I was going to say stow away, but <laughs> they had a cameraman. It's like, it's like this whole different like operation that they had going on. They had a cameraman go onto the sh Shinkansen and film outside the window to get those shots to kind of layer in, um, in the, you know, on the screen behind the interior sets that they were built. It's all this stuff that's going on. And I just found it so funny that just that, that title, big explosion, was you know they the <laughs> the Japanese railroad company was not happy about the optics of that title so the that kind of soured things and then they had to go through a lot of they had to jump through a lot of different hoops illegally um to get the shots that they they needed for this film uh, anyway so let's get into the movie itself before I get carried away with all the behind the scenes details that I really enjoy um, the movie as I kind of set up um, is about the the bullet train um, it's I think the route, I forget how long it's supposed to take, um, but it's like a, it's a very long line. And because of the speed of this train, you know, you can get to, you can cross a great distance in a much shorter period of time, but it's not like it's a two hour train, right? It's like 10, 11 hours, I think. And, or maybe it's less because the time um, is elongated once they realize a bomb's on the train because they get the driver of the train to slow down, but not slow enough that it gets to that 80 kilometers per hour point. They've been told by the bomber that, you know, once that train goes below 80 kilometers, it's going to blow up and there's 1500 passengers on board. And so they're trying to do everything they can to resolve the situation with this guy who said that he's planted a bomb on the train. And I think this, it's about seven or eight hours or something to that effect. Um, once the train has slowed down. Um, and so you, 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 it's not like it's speed where it's like, it's a constant ratcheting of tension and it's like, it could happen at any moment because they've got so much time to, to figure this out. But what I love about that is that it feels so much more grounded in this kind of a story. Um, because initially me as a viewer, I was thinking, oh, well, they've got loads of time to figure this out. You know, that's seven, eight hours. That's, you know, there's so much time for them to, kind of find the bomb or kind of come to an agreement with the bomber. Um, but then as the film rolls on, it becomes so frustrating because all these, these hurdles keep popping up and just all the threads that are being pulled and tangled and twisted. And then, you know, you suddenly realize the time is slipping away. And it just reminds me of situations in life where you feel like you've got a lot of time to accomplish something like a task or something. And then the, the time just slips away when you become overconfident in that. And that's the sense I got in this film. It's two and a half hours long. It really didn't feel that the pacing was phenomenal. Uh, so Junior Sato directed this film. I don't think I've seen any of his films previously. And the the star of the movie, um, I mean, I don't know who was a bigger star at the time that this thing was made. But certainly for me, looking at it from the outside, I see the name Sonny Chiba. Shinichi Chiba and I and I, I gravitate towards that and he's the, he's surely the hero of the movie in a sense he is in a sense he is and he's the driver of the bullet train 
And I would say he's probably in the movie for about 10 minutes, you know, maybe 15 at a push, but probably not even that really. Um, he's very rarely in it, but he's there at very key moments. And he does a brilliant job, I have to say, Sonny Chiba. There's a real sense of uh, urgency, of, you know, panic at times. I just feel like he really, you know, he grounds the story because he's the driver of this train, which is the, the plot device that's moving everything forward, literally. And if he's not selling it, then, you know, um, I think that it, it would be difficult for the rest of the film to work as well as it does. And I think he really does a great job, but he's his screen time is minimal. But you don't always need a huge amount of screen time to make an impact. You know, look at like Darth Vader and Star Wars. I think Anthony Hopkins and Silence of the Lambs, they're both in their respective movies for about 15 minutes, I think. Not that Sonny Chiba's performance in The Bullet Train is comparable to those two iconic, you know, characters and performances, but, you know, he does a lot with a little, I would say. Um, but Ken Takakura is essentially the lead of the film. And what I found really interesting, there's an interview on the on the disc with the director, Junya Sato, and he calls the bombers, the three terrorists who plant this bomb on the train, he calls them the protagonists. And it's really interesting because as we're moving into like the final five minutes of the film and, and even before that, and I was talking to Connie as we're watching it, I'm thinking like, you know, I kind of want them to continue getting away with this, you know? And it's really interesting how, and I don't want to keep comparing it to speed, but it is an analog, I guess, for people who maybe haven't seen the bullet train or whatever. Um, you know, Dennis Hopper, he's, you know, there's a reason for why he's doing it, but he's very over the top villain. Um, Ken Takakura's character, um, Tetsuo Okita, he is in many ways a sympathetic character. He is not a villain in the traditional sense. Uh, he's, there's nothing over the top of it. It's very restrained performance. He's a very serious character. And he's laid out this whole plot um, where he's going to plant this tachometer onto the, the, the train. And he actually ran a small business. Um, and that produced kind of uh, electronic equipment, but also like uh, mechanical equipment and tachometers. And he reveals to the, these two people who are close to him, you have these three guys who, well, the two guys have been brought in by Okita to kind of help him plant the bomb. But he wants a certain, I think it's 20 million yen, something to that, to that effect from the government, um, you know, for, and he'll tell them where the bomb is, how to disarm it, and so on, and, and how the train can then stop. Um, but, you know, the, the reason for it um, is because he ran this small business, and he was made redundant, and he was put out of business. And this is something that was happening in Japan at the time, where it was like this, uh, uh, the kind of, an econ the economic miracle, um, Sato describes it as, where, you know, big business kind of booming economy and stuff, but smaller businesses were suffering and going out of business because of it. And he had everything taken away from him. And so he just wants to kind of get what's his basically. But for him, it's not about killing anyone. It's about putting that kind of a serious threat in the minds of the government to then give him this money that he feels like he's owed. And then no one gets hurt. You know, that's the goal. The goal isn't to kill anyone, but it's still terrorism, right? So, that, and it, it reminds me again, really randomly to, in a completely different kind of uh, frame of reference here, but it reminds me of Quentin Tarantino talking about the film Joker, where he's talking about how, and spoilers if you haven't seen Joker, but he says, you know, that film makes you want to see Joaquin Phoenix shoot Robert De Niro in the face. Like it's wrong, but the film makes you want to see it, you know? And and that is kind of what happens in the bullet train. Well, not in that exact kind of framing, but, you know, you kind of could be, I think it's because like the, the way that he's planned, how he's going to get the money, where the police are going to meet him, how the money's going to be exchanged. And it's lots of things that are planned and he's hiding in plain sight. And it's kind of fun and almost like a spy movie at times. And you, it's such an elaborate plot that you want to see how, how, how does he want to get away with it? Will he get away with it? And you also realize that if he gets the money, then no one gets hurt. So it kind of lets you off the hook a little bit, but you kind of want to see him get away with it scot-free, you know. And, you know, it shows you how these guys were down on their luck and the, the young kid who's with them is, was reduced to just selling his blood to, to get by, you know, to make money that way. So... They do frame them in a fairly sympathetic light. And I think Ken Takakura is just 
got such a great screen presence. You know, he's just a really, I, I read in the booklet, it said that some call him the Clint Eastwood of Japan. He has that kind of smoldering intensity to him and he really carries the film wonderfully, I think. And, you know, you kind of have these three fairly important characters, um, one being Ken Takakura as the the leader of this plot to to bomb this um this this train. Then you have the train driver, played by Sonny Chiba. Uh, but then you have um, the guy who is the, the Shinkansen director. He's working in the control room, and it's this big board with all these lights that shows you all the different lines and how the, the journey of the bullet train is moving through Japan and everything like that. And he, once the, the plot has been revealed, the bombing plot that he takes over as the guy who's trying to, um, you know, uh, relay with Sonny Chiba's character on the train and kind of figure things out. And he kind of becomes the face of the whole stories. He appears on, on TV, making pleas to the bomber and stuff like that. And this character is played by Ken uh, Utsui and his character's name is Kuramachi. And for me, he is the beating heart of the film and where there may be moral ambiguity to Okita's character Kuromachi is, you know, he is the the morally, you know, righteous character of the film. And, and yeah, he's the hero, I would say, because he always is trying to do the right thing. And there's a really great moment towards the end because, you know, when the film kind of uh, reaches conclusion, we're a little bit past the, the fate of the train. What happens with the train happens. And then we have like another 15 or so minutes. There's a few more twists and turns yet. And there's just this beat where Kuromachi just, he, he's been very, you know, um, in, you know, highly emotionally affected by what's happened with this whole incident as anyone would be. And he leaves the control room and he just has this moment and we linger on it for a while. And I just think, you know, you, you could have just skated past that, but Sato, he, he focuses on it and he, he lets it breathe and I thought that that ended up being one of the more powerful moments of the whole film was how Kuromachi's character's um, arc comes to its conclusion and the way that we just kind of have that moment afterwards um, that I thought was just really, really well done and portrayed. Now, one thing I wasn't expecting is that there wasn't so much of a focus on the passengers. There is, and there's a woman who's pregnant, and that's a whole dramatic kind of device in the film too, to, to create suspense as the woman who's who's, who's pregnant and kind of goes into labor while the, the whole thing is going on. But mostly the, the passengers, you see them every now and then there's a bit of panic and people trying to get to phones and things, but really it's about the guys who have, have planted the bomb and them trying to get the money. And then also flashbacks to show how it all came together. And so you have the police who are like constantly messing things up. You have the, the railway company and Kuromachi in the control room. You have the, the people on the train and Sonny Chiba driving the train. And then you have the three conspirators of the, the, you know, the bombing plot. A lot going on in the film, but it is weaved together beautifully. Um, I just think that the pacing, you know, the, the, the construction of the film, you know, was just fantastic. And um, like, you know, the, the melding of different shots of the train, whether it be stolen gorilla style shots or the miniatures that apparently the miniatures for the train, they weren't electrical. They, they had no motor to them. And the way that they moved on screen is that they built the kind of the, the train tracks on an incline of 30 degrees. So you just place the model train on and it would run down on its, on its own. Then you'd follow it with the camera and presumably tilt it to the way that it looked straight, which I thought was an ingenious kind of, um, uh, method to kind of capture that but there's 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 great moments of suspense but also i just love the the rich characterization and anchored by really the two i would say main performances from ken takakura and uh, ken utsui who um they they bring two very different things to the table and really make the film work um i i enjoyed hearing about kind of the backstory of some of these actors and uh, in the extras on the Blu-ray, which we'll get to in just a second. But yeah, it was a new, another new experience for me. I wasn't really familiar with too many of the actors, although it was great to see um, Takashi Shimura show up, you know, uh, one of the all-time great actors, Japanese or otherwise, you know, just what a legend. I mean, he, he has nothing to really do in the film. He's like a, a president of a company or something, part of the government. And, uh, but you know, there's a lot of like, 
that you know talk about like you know characters and, and and cast i mean it's it's a lot of people apparently there's a lot of cameos that i wouldn't obviously be privy to because i'm not too well versed in japanese actors at any point in the history of cinema really unless we're talking about like the 1950s even then you know um it, it would just be like the basic stuff of you know, people who are in seven samurai and uh, kurosawa movies but yeah uh it was it was kind of almost um mind-boggling to imagine putting that many characters into a film because there's just so many things going on but it's the the important stuff is focused on really well and the characters are all you know the characters that that need to mean something are really well rounded i felt um and there's yeah there's a lot of really good stuff in this film and i just really enjoy it. it's a highly entertaining film didn't feel its length and uh and i love kind of disaster movies and this isn't really a disaster movie but it kind of almost falls into that and they were heavily Toei were heavily inspired by the American disaster hit pictures of the night early 1970s towering inferno and so on when they made this and uh certainly there's a different twist in it because it's this terrorism angle and stuff and we talked earlier about you know the doomsday flight and things like that but I just think it's a nice mixture of the feeling of a disaster movie where you have all these people trying to figure out how to stop it um, and kind of a suspense thriller at the same time. It's a, it's a great device about a moving vehicle that's, that's speeding towards a destination. And you have like the moral quandaries of, you know, like the, the government, the police, and then like the railway company saying like, you know, do we just let the bomb go off, you know, in between stations to minimize the casualties? And that's where Kuramachi really shines the, the, the Shinkansen director, because he, he wants to save those 1500 people at all costs. He is all about saving the lives. And it's nice to see the juxtaposition between um, Ken Takakura's character, who's so morally ambiguous. And then you have someone who is just so, again, morally righteous. Uh, well, righteous almost makes it seem like a bad thing, but he is, he's, you know, he really has pure intentions and it is very heroic in a way that I felt wasn't shoved down my throat too much. And it just, it felt really genuine and uh just two very different sides of maybe the same coin i suppose um you have one guy who worked in small businesses had his own small business and his life was taken away from him because of you know circumstances outside of his control they never guy who works you know with the railroad company government job you know and that's not going to happen he's not get he's not going to get made redundant from a job that's so secure so you kind of have that clash there as well as the kind of the economic standings of both those characters um but yeah there's you know i, I could keep going on about the movie and you know the the score was one thing that <laughs> severely dated the movie uh, i kind of liked it, it was a very 70s funky score you got the keyboards the dude i kind of <laughs> know what that was but like you know it's got the keyboards like the the wacka 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 like the guitar kind of you know it reminds you like Jimi hendrix like wacka wacka that's terrible. I'll leave it in for free and even embarrass myself. But it's, you know, I, I, I'm no Michael Winslow, but it's, you know, just that kind of like 70s, like funky, you know, cheesy, funky. And it's just, you know, the opening credits, it's just like the, the title comes up and then you just get this like funky 70s music going. And it's just, it's, I mean, obviously you look at it and just like the film stock, the the fashion, you know, is, is very 70s and stuff, but the music is just like, no, we're really 70s. Like the music like stamps that 70s-ness down, you know, irrefutably. Like, and I, I kind of enjoyed it in some parts. It was uh, maybe not fitting to some certain scenes, I suppose, but uh, you know, there was, there was a charm to it at the same at the same time. Anyway, all that to say, I thought the bullet train was fantastic. I absolutely loved it. Definitely film I'll go back to um, again and again. And I hope anyway, yeah, you know, I, I think that sometimes and, I, and then I morbidly think like, God, will I live long enough to watch this film again and again? You know, really, and that's only because I I rarely revisit films unless like they're even film. That, no, I, I find the older I get, the less I even revisit my very favorite films. So it's you know, I I often say that in videos. I can't wait to watch this again and again. I think, well, maybe I'll never watch it again. Maybe I'll just won't have the time, and there'll just be so many other new things. I don't know. And then that makes you kind of get into the <laughs> into the headspace of like down the rabbit hole of wait. <laughs> Maybe I'm never going to watch any of these again. Like if I just like, you know, it's this collection, just the most pointless thing in existence. Who knows? Anyway, so um, let's talk about the, the action. And, you know, just the whole 
package to me. This is one of my favorite Blu-rays that's come out in quite some time. Probably my favorite release of the year so far. And by favorite release, I mean like the whole package. So first and foremost, this artwork on the front by Tony Stella, who is quickly rising the ranks of, you know, artwork on boutique label Blu-rays this year. Um, I don't know when he started doing these kind of releases, but man, his stuff is just coming from strength to strength. And I think he just did the artwork on the the new newly announced um, Bruce Lee Arrow video set, which looks fucking nuts. But this this artwork is absolutely phenomenal. And uh, that's one part of the release is the, the presentation, the packaging. Um, so if we open it up, I'll, I'll take the slip cover off, I should say. Um, you have the same artwork on the inside. And then if you flip it around, you have like the a classic poster there, which just looks so cool. And again, 70s, it just it evokes that kind of classic 70s style disaster movie poster. And uh, and that's kind of another element of the release. The transfer, uh, which is from a 2K restoration, the original Japanese theatrical version of the film, I thought looked really good. Um, you know, it's it still is to me thrilling to see this kind of film um, which, you know, it, it's not like this is a classic film. It's not like this is a film that everyone talks about. It's not like this is held in the same kind of uh, reverence of like Kurosawa's best films. When you talk to anyone who's even, you know, kind of vaguely um, familiar with world cinema and they know Seven Samurai or whatever it is, um, Bullet Train is not going to come up, you know. And it's um, it's one of those things where it's a really, really damn good film. And to get it in this kind of quality... At a point in time now where, you know, 2023, people are still saying that, you know, physical media is dead and stuff. And, you know, it's, it's really, to me, heartwarming, which sounds a bit over the top. But it is to, to, to see films like this get like a really nice treatment uh, with the 2K restoration. And uh, it even says on the back of the Blu-ray, the 1994 Hollywood blockbuster Speed. The, the, the comparisons are just unavoidable at this point. And there's been some debate over whether or not the writer of Speed was was really had seen Bullet Train and was inspired by it, but nevertheless, um, so you know the film itself is great, great artwork, great alternate artwork, and then the you know the the transfer is great as I said, but then the extras are fantastic. Let's talk about the extras because I really want to get into this. First and foremost, we have a brand new audio commentary by Jasper Sharp and Tom Mez on the theatrical version of the film. Um, Really good commentary, as a lot of these kind of critic writer commentaries tend to be. They're not really like scene specific. I mean, they they sat there watching the movie, but they don't really comment on the film as it's running that much. It's really going into like biographies of the actors, talking about the studio Toei, talking about the director Junior Sato, and where this sits in his filmography. Um, talking about this is really interesting. That um, oh no, maybe it, this that was mentioned in the Tony Rains interview. Well, I'll talk about it now. That Tony Raines talks about in his piece on the Blu-ray, which is fantastic. Obviously, Tony Raines knows his shit and is great at delivering information. And it's just a fountain of knowledge for Asian cinema across the board. And he talks about how Toei used to have this um, uh, kind of uh, en entrance exam. You know, you'd, you'd need to to kind of to work for the studio, and there was a you know fairly kind of segregated studio system in Japan at that time where each studio would kind of have be off doing their own thing, their own kind of genre pictures and stuff like that. But if you were to apply to work at Toei, you would need to provide your kind of exam results, you know, your qualifications, and then sit an entrance exam. I don't know what that entails, um, but see, he he presumes that Junior Sato probably did the same thing. And then you would work for a studio and you'd be kind of, that would be your place to work in. You wouldn't mingle in between and do different jobs and kind of cross pollinate between studios and so on. I just found that idea, just an entrance exam to, to work at a movie studio just seemed like a weird concept to me. But I mean, at the same time, it kind of makes sense, I guess. But yeah, in the commentary, I, I just really enjoyed all the information because I loved, and it's one of those things where, um, you know, they're talking about all these films and they sound fascinating. They talked a lot about the political aspect of this film. They talked about real life bombings in Japan or bomb threats. And uh, there's one incident that they were talking about, which sounds fascinating. And there's a movie that was made about it. And I, I, I couldn't really keep up with all the things and note down everything that I wanted to see. But, you know, there's just, again, like the Tony Raines interview, 
and you know featurette, just a fountain of knowledge. And I really enjoyed the uh, the kind of rapport between Tom and Jasper and uh, you could feel the passion that came out with them and they kind of joke at the beginning like well we got two and a half hours to get through this you know and then the end of it they're like wow that went really quickly and um, I I almost felt like there was more they could have gone into you know but I really enjoyed the audio commentary quite a lot then we have um, Off the Rails uh, Junya Sato's biographers on the making of the bullet train this is a brand new interview with film writer Tatsuya Masuto and film critic Masaki Nomura. And this is a really good feature. Uh, just a random aside, I thought it was interesting how the lighting on um, Masuto um, just was very Kylo Ren. <laughs> kind of the, the red and the, the, the hint of blue there. I don't know what was going on. It, just, it, it took me right to The Force Awakens and that kind of the kind of the, the light and the dark kind of uh, metaphorical symbolic lighting on the face of Kylo Ren. Anyway, uh, they talk about approaching Sato to write a book about him and, and his career and so on and so forth. And they talk a lot about, you know, the behind the scenes production of the film. They talk about how a snorkel camera was used. And Sato talks about this as well elsewhere on the Blu-ray um, to film the miniature train. So this is like a camera on a pole that can fit in between these models. And it was a very expensive camera, the snorkel camera and cost a lot of money and was one of the reasons that the film cost a lot to make. Um, but yeah, this is a really good one because they obviously know their stuff. They did the biography on him and things, and they talk about some kind of funny stories and occurrences. And one thing I want to talk about when it comes to the bullet train uh, and all this behind the scenes stuff, and that's that's one thing I can really praise about this release is that there is there's one, two, three, there's four featurettes slash interviews on the disc. And these amount to like 90 minutes of material. Then there's the audio commentary. So that's, you know, two and a half hours. Now we're up to four hours of people talking about the bullet train. Then there's the booklet, right? Um, So you get a lot of stuff in terms of behind the scenes stories and information. And I didn't really feel like a lot of ground was repeated across all five or all six of those elements, the four featurettes, the commentary and the booklet with an essay and by, I think Barry Forshaw, we'll get to that in a second. So I think it was a really well balanced in that sense. And I'm sure that wasn't coordinated in any way, but just kind of, there's a lot to say about the film, but there seems to be, and I don't know whether I should just research this myself, but obviously I'm sat here doing the video, so I'm not going to do that. But, um, you know, the, the history of whether this film was successful or not, Seems very up in the air. Uh, in the booklet, let's just get to the booklet. I mean, I'm not going all over the place here and I'm not really structuring this very well, but um, there's a lot to go through basically because there's a lot of things I wanted to comment on. So the booklet um, essay is called Riding the Bullet Train by Barry Forshaw. And in this um, booklet, he talks about the film being a huge success. The bullet train was a massive hit in Japan, he says. But by the time it was rejigged for international distribution, it had undergone some severe pruning. Now, this is mentioned many times, but um, in the case of uh, Junior Sato, he talks about how the film wasn't really profitable when it came out. And one of the reasons for that was they were finishing this film right down to the wire. So it was a few, I think a couple of days before the film was set to be released and they had that release date, you know, solidly, you know, like that you have to meet the release date, you know. Um, so they were working right down to the wire. They just about finished it. The film came out, but because of that, they couldn't do press screenings. And so the, the great kind of free publicity, as he puts it, um, was not there for the film. And so it didn't do as well, but when it was released internationally and the film was very much kind of, um, built to kind of be an international kind of appealing movie, um, it became a big success overseas, particularly in France. And Sato says that he didn't realize that because you know the these countries had bought the rights to to show the film, they also had the right to edit the film, and so the French version of the movie was severely truncated and took um, all of the kind of backstory of the bombers and their motivations out of the film and made them kind of purely villains and took a lot of the nuance and kind of what makes the film unique, I think. But it was very successful and people really enjoyed it and it became so successful that they released the French version of the film in Japan and that became a huge hit. And there was even like Japanese critics who thought it was a better version of the film. So that's kind of a a very intriguing story. But, you know, um, I think even Tony Rain said it was a big hit. 
and then elsewhere they say that it wasn't. So I, I don't know, you know, whether it was or not because you're getting conflicting information, but it is what it is. And, uh, you know, sometimes certain sources aren't entirely correct, I guess. But yeah, so the, the interview with the biographers was very good. I really enjoyed that. There's some great information there. Uh, then there's the Tony Rain's piece, which I talked about um, a little bit. You know, this is like over half an hour and he just really gets into it. A lot of great stuff, again, as you can always expect from Tony Rain's. And, you know, how else could I really sell this, uh, this Blu-ray to you other than it has a Tony Rain's interview on it that's a meaty half an hour kind of discussion and kind of almost lecture on the bullet train and Junior Sato and some of the actors like Ken Takakura and and so on and Sonny Chiba. Um, but to tell you that there is a moment in this interview where Tony Rain says, them days is gone. And don't you just want to know what he was referring to when he said that? I was just, he, he's so well spoken and just out of nowhere he's like them days is gone and I just it, <laughs> kind of like, it was this really dissonant moment where it just it really amused me but anyway fantastic from Tony Raines as always uh, then we have Kim Newman on Mad Bombers in Cinema brand new interview with author Kim Newman um, about Mad Bombers in Cinema he talks about the bullet train of course and uh, but he really talks about like the origins of the Mad Bomber genre and uh, also goes way back to Hitchcock in the 30s with Sabotage, which is a film I love. And it has a bomb on a bus and the suspense that comes out of that. And there's a really good analogy or um, example, I guess, that Hitchcock kind of presented when it comes to suspense in films that Kim Newman talks about. I'd never heard this before. But Hitchcock apparently said that, you know, what makes great suspense is imagine you're you're seeing a scene in a movie with a bunch of men around a table playing cards and there's a bomb planted under the table. Um, you don't know it's there. They don't know it's there. They're playing cards and the bomb explodes. And it's a big shock moment. Like what the fuck happened? There? Oh my God. And it, it shocks you. It jolts you. It draws you in. But now imagine a version of that scene where there's a bunch of men around a table playing cards. There's a bomb planted underneath it but you, the audience, see that it's there and that the clock is ticking down and they're just continuing on, not completely unaware of this. That's suspense because now they're saying, oh, well, sh should we leave now? Well, let's just play another round, you know, and they're completely chill and then they'll just, oh, let's, you know, and, and the, the way that it kind of builds, that's kind of how you do suspense. And that's a great way of putting it. And that, but it's a very good feature out in Kim Newman you know, very well versed as well. And, uh, and talks a lot about mad bombers and kind of, how, again, like from like a bomb being planted on a bus to the evolution of that. And then the, the disaster movie and how bullet train kind of, you know, kind of segues into that very, very well done. It's like 15, 16 minutes long. And then we have big movie, big panic, uh, junior Sato on the bullet train an archival featurette I believe Twilight Time produced that in 2016 and he passed away a few years after that in 2019. But it's great to get an interview with the director on the Blu-ray. And he, he talks about his motivations of making the film, the origins of making the film, how he came to presenting the idea and working with the producer and, and uh, the casting director and stuff. And I really like his kind of outlook on movies and how respectful he is of the process of making films. He talks about how much he appreciates the crew um, <clears throat> who worked on the film for him and stuff. And, and also he talks a little bit about the writing of the movie, which is really odd that, I mean, I've heard the story a couple of times throughout the future acts about how him and his co-writer, uh, Yunosuke, uh, Ono, they hold up in a hotel for a month to, to write this movie. But the way they did it, um, is a really strange method of co-writing. So Junya Sato wrote the first half of the film and Yunosuke <laughs> Ono wrote the second half of the film and they'd write a bit every day and then meet up for, for dinner and kind of compare notes, I guess. It just seemed like a strange way to, to put a movie together, but then I guess whatever works, right? He also talks about who was originally envisioned as the, the lead star of the film, which eventually went to Ken Takakura. They actually first wanted to cast Bunta Sugawara as the, the lead of the film Okita, the bomber. Um, but his wife, Sugawara's wife, apparently read the script and said to him, well, the main character is the train. And so he declined to take part in the film. Uh, obviously, he was a, a big name at that point and kind of doing the Yakuza movies. And Ken Takakura had 
kind of made a name for himself making Yakuza movies, but he was doing the the honorable Yakuza movies. Whereas in the this kind of 70s, that, that switched over to more kind of hard-nosed, gritty, you know, um, no honor, no humanity style kind of Yakuza movies where kind of the moral um, aspect was kind of completely thrown out the window and it's just bloodshed and wild abandon. Whereas um, Takakura was in these kind of honorable Yakuza movies where it's about, you know, it's about doing the right thing, all that kind of stuff. But he came in and uh, and did a great job. Uh, it's just interesting to hear kind of those little casting tidbits and things and how also the film was shot in 40 days, which, I don't know, I don't really have a metric for how most films are shot in terms of number of days or anything, but 40 days seems fairly brisk for a movie of this size in terms of cast, characters, running time, you know. But uh, yeah, they, they certainly knew what they wanted to do and they got it filmed. And he also talks about just um, at that point in time, which was 2016 when the interview was shot, that, you know, digital filmmaking is is really the, the primary form of making movies now and how that's great in terms of shooting and um, getting things done and everything. But he, you know, he kind of recognizes that back in the 70s when he was able to make films like this, that there were studios who would fund movies like this, whereas now it's a lot harder to get kind of um, funding for independent films and so on, and studio systems are different. And he kind of doesn't have much faith in kind of, you know, moviegoers showing up to cinemas, and he feels like the, you know, the kind of the, the film world in Japan was dwindling at that point, um, and not as many films were getting made as there used to be, even though there's that ease of um, of digital, digital shooting and things like that instead of film, but just the you know the the lack of funding I suppose for movies like this um, was something that he touched on and I was a really great interview with the director and I just enjoyed him he even like gave kind of respect and reverence to the extras you know so it seems like a guy who really loved making movies and kind of loved the process of it so a great to have an interview with the director on this release so those are the four featurettes the biographers of Sato Tony Raines Kim Newman and then the feature at an interview with the director himself. There's two trailers as well, which uh, I enjoy watching. I like seeing kind of the, I just repeat myself every time I do a review, you know, it's just cool to see how these movies were promoted and to see the trailers. Um, but there's nothing, nothing especially interesting. I noted in either of them when I watched them to talk about in this review. And on top of all those extras, you also have an alternate version of the film, which is the English export cut, which is around two hours, just under two hours long. It's not the French version, which removes all the backstory and kind of details on the three bombers. But from what I can tell, just skimming through, because I didn't watch it, um, it seems like it still removes that, like that's where the other half an hour has gone. There's more of that backstory and things like that. But also, interestingly enough, there's a couple of effect shots in the film that aren't in the Japanese version. Um, but those come from a lower quality source, including the opening credits and the end title card that just says the end. And it says when you start the film on the Blu-ray menu, it gives you a description of some of these things and these changes. So they've basically used the restored version of the film as the base for this to kind of make it look a lot better than it normally would have. Um, and you get the English dub, obviously, that goes along with this. And it was a version that was made for English speaking territories. And so there's also a few issues in terms of like Japanese text being on screen that wouldn't have ordinarily been on the English export version but they've kind of tried to make it as kind of user-friendly as possible, basically just to give you the best looking kind of uh, version of the English export cut of the film, which is pretty cool. But for me personally, having watched the two and a half hour version, I, I didn't really feel the need to watch, uh, you know, for me, a lesser version of the film because I didn't feel like it was too long or had too much in it. So yeah, it's nice that they included it. I think it's great that they did that. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it feels like a rounder release because of it, but it's probably not something I'll go to. Um, but I like, it's this weird thing. I like that it's there, you know, it feels more complete that way. And I'm really glad that they included it. So that's all the extras. Let's just round off a tiny bit with the booklet. Again, I already kind of touched on it a little bit, but there is a piece from Barry Forshaw and it's a pretty good little piece that again, to, I, I read this after everything else and there were still things I hadn't kind of heard. And it talks about what kind of genres the different studios were doing at the time and 
which ones are doing the the kaiju movies, which ones are doing kind of uh, movies focused towards female audiences and things like that. A little bit of a biography on Ken Takakura and uh, and uh, Sonny Chiba. And I, I looked, I just did a quick search on Sonny Chiba, and it was incredible to me just how much experience he had as a martial artist. And there's like six or seven different kind of um, forms of martial arts that he like had black belts in, you know, and he had a very interesting career as well, which is just, I'm not even going to get into it because it's, you know, we're running on time here as, as it is, but yeah, this is a really good piece. I'm very for sure. I really enjoyed it. And uh, he kind of gives a shout out to two other movies from Sato at the end. And, um, and also talks about the final shot of the film, which is a very, um, a very evocative moment at the very end of the film that I don't want to talk about too much or even show it, but it's visually arresting. And apparently it was the, the, there's a stylic, a stylic, I'll leave that in for free, not a stylic, a stylistic choice that was made, um, that I thought was very striking. That, that to match the arresting image of what was, was going, going on in that final shot. Right. But apparently according to Barry Forshaw, that was a malfunction in the camera that caused the stylistic, you know, nature of what you see in the very final shot of the film. I don't know if I believe that because it almost seems too convenient and too beautiful and too perfect, but man, what, what, what a memorable final shot. And everything about that final five minutes is just fantastic. It's just a, such a great button to the film. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. You know, I, I, again, I, this is one I could go on and on about probably. And I feel like I barely even talked about the film because there's loads of really good little scenes and things. I mean, it's no masterpiece. I mean, that's, that's for sure. And again, full disclosure, I am already kind of in the bag for movies set on trains and things. I would say again that the majority of the film isn't on the train as much, but it's about the the drama surrounding it. And I loved all that stuff. And, you know, just people answering phones and get me this guy. And, you know, we're, we're going to speak to this guy and make sure that the, the box is there at this point in time. And then there's someone else in a phone box. And it's like, there's a helicopter going overhead. And then it's like, we got to make sure that, you know, I love all that shit. It's really fun to me. So it was basically everything I was hoping for and just that little bit better because I wasn't expecting that moral ambiguity with the characters, which made everything feel a lot more complex and interesting and enjoyable by the end. So yeah, fantastic release across the board, great extras, hours and hours worth of stuff. And I love that artwork once again. So another phenomenal release from Eureka and um, that's about it. So thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in the next one.